Hi, my name is Sorrentin. I'm presenting uh, uh, for the first, first for the fourth also, and I'm presenting the paper uh, "Unsupervised Lesion Detection via Image Restoration uh, with the Normative Prior." So before we start, let's do a simple test. That uh, what you see here is uh, normal brain images acquired in T2 domain from healthy subjects. <coughs> And um, let's just have a rough idea of the healthy patterns of the healthy subjects. Then I will move on to give you some test images that you can immediately see there's something wrong in them. Um, and then these are the answers. So with more training, you will definitely get more accurate boundaries of this segmentation. So we know that uh, as a human being, we don't need a lot of annotations to be able to annotate uh, the, the, the lesion of the, the brain images. So we're thinking it will also be great if the algorithm can also do it. So if the algorithm is also able to do it, it will, it will lead to uh, many useful applications. For example, the detection during acquisition and pre-screening. If we also want to do it like uh, conventionally using the supervised methods, we have to get exponentially large data sets to train them. Um, so this problem is also formulated as uh, unsupervised anomaly detection and many methods have been proposed to solve this problem. And our proposed method falls into the line of research uh, of the <coughs> method based on generative model where we first learn a uh, normative data distribution and we check uh, when the test data comes in does it follow the normative distribution that we estimated. Um, so to do this, uh, we have the following assumptions. Uh, the first is the image with lesions will have different features than healthy uh, images. Then, and the second is uh, a normative data distribution can be effectively learned by a generative model. So with, the, with these two assumptions that we know if we have an image with lesion and the image will not fit in the normative uh, data distribution as Px. Um, so before introducing the generative model, let's uh, have a look at the latent space model first. So here on the, on the left, we define a latent space Z that's uh, of, di of dimension uh, D. And then we have uh, a, a projection operator that map uh, from la latent space Z to the image space X. And we, learn this, uh, we, learn, we can learn this mapping from the Z to X. And if, if, the, in, if the, in the latent space, we have a, di uh, a distribution, for example, a Gaussian distribution, uh, we can learn the image distribution with the equation on, on this slide. So in the deep learning field, there are two popular uh, generative models at the moment. So the first one is generative adversarial networks, and it, it uh, consists of two components. One of them is a generator that's mapped the, uh, from the latent space to the, to the image space, and then the, sec uh, the other uh, component is the discriminator, which uh, tries to tell the generator if it's generating uh, a valid image or not. So the mapping uh, overall is learned by this mean max op optimization. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> thank you. And we have the, uh, we have the method uh, Anogan, which is based on this uh, GAN model, and they can generative, uh, it can generate relative, relative, relatively good uh, images. And uh, in the testing phase, uh, uh, it will learn, uh, uh, the, the projection operator will uh, be optimized in the latent space to find the inverse mapping from the image space back into the latent space. Uh, the problem here uh, is that uh, the inverse mapping might not always be guaranteed uh, due to possible mode collapse in GAN. And the other method, uh, the other model is version of autoencoder. So in this method, the mapping is in two way. It's, uh, it's from the image space to the latent space and back from the latent space to, to the image space. And the mapping is estimated by uh, maximizing the evidence lower bound. And uh, to detect the uh, lesion with this method, so no expl explicit uh, optimization is needed in the latent space, and the detection is uh, achieved by calculating the reconstruction error. Uh, so the, uh, the problem with this method could be that in there, there are also some cases where uh, the image is not 100% faithfully reconstructed, so we might end up with many false positives. 
So we go on to formulate uh, this problem as a restoration problem where we can use this uh, normative data distribution estimated by the generative model as the prior, uh, as the prior model. So specifically, our method is a two-step learn and restore method. In the first step, we uh, learn the data prior from healthy images with the VE or VE-based method. And in the second step, we perform uh, image restoration where we remove the abnormal regions from the image using the data prior that we estimated in the first step. And uh, the restoration is performed by Form, uh, formulating this maximum a posteriori problem, and the, the restoration is performed iteratively. At the end, we will have a restored image, and the addition can be detected by calculating the absolute difference between uh, the input image and the restored image. Uh, so, uh, while training a VE or VE-based method is ra uh, rather straightforward and has been demonstrated in their or original paper, so we give more details about the image restoration step. So, to restore the image, we, uh, we assume uh, the lesion as, as noise, so we have the following formulation that the abnormal image consists of the normal image, uh, plus noise, which is the lesion in our case. And f uh, with this assumption, we can further formulate the maximum a posteriori problem in the, uh, in the, as the second, uh, the second equation. And this map problem can be solved by uh, gradient ascent iteratively and with the learning rate of eta. Uh, so we have the map formulation, exactly how do we calculate the two terms on the right-hand side. So we have the log px, which is already estimated as the data prior, and then we treat the first term, the log py given x, as the data consistency term, where we will give more details in later slides. And this can be, appro this can be approximated as the second equation where uh, we use this TV norm uh, as the data consistency term and, uh, and weight it with the lambda. And also we substitute this log Px with elbow, which is estimated from a VE or VE-based method. Of the reason for this substitution is that we cannot uh, exactly calculate the Px in this term. So now we have the uh, now we have uh, we are able to calculate the two terms. Then we still need to find the empirical weight term for the data consistency. Uh, so if we perform this uh, image restoration on the healthy images, we will expect the healthy images to change the least. So we first will define. Um, uh, the L1 distance between the input image and the restored image as the image change. And we will find a, a, a lambda such that uh, the, the image restoration incurs the least uh, image change on the healthy data. So here we use uh, a, a validation set that is uh, not, not a part of our training data. So the lambda can be found by generating this plot. Uh, so now we can uh, we, now we can perform uh, this uh, maximum a post, uh, maximum a posteriori problem, and we can solve it by gradient ascent. We will finally arrive at the solution of x star, which is our final restoration. So uh, with this x star, we can already calculate the absolute difference between the restored image and the input image. So we will get a continuous map. But our final goal is to get the segmentation map, which is a binary map. So so we need to convert the continuous map into this binary map with a threshold. So we will find the threshold such that this threshold will give us uh, a certain number of certain number of, uh, of false positives on the on the healthy data. For the reason that is during training we still don't have access to the test data, which are image with lesions. So we have to decide the threshold uh, based on uh, the healthy data alone. So uh, so this false positive rate can be uh, arbitrarily chosen for specific tasks. So uh, now we have the method. We're going to train our method and test our method on real images to ev evaluate its performance. 
uh, in detail, we train our data sets, uh, uh, train our model on, uh, train on, on CAMCAN, which is, which, which is a data set consisting of uh, healthy subjects. And then we go on to test our, our methods on BRADS 2017. Uh, both of them are publicly available data sets. And specifically, we choose the false positive rate as 1%, 5%, and 10%. And here we uh, automatically tune the data consistent weight as 1.8. So, so here uh, in, our, in our method, we used uh, two models to learn the data prior. One of them is versional autoencoder. The other is the Gaussian mixture versional autoencoder, which has a higher uh, data representation capacity. Uh, so we uh, we run our model and we also compare to established established baselines. So with the uh, detection method, uh, with the detection results, we can plot the rock curve, uh, where we compare to baselines, for example, versional autoencoder and adversarial autoencoder and Anogan, as well as uh, Gaussian mixture model, uh, which is proposed by Limpo et al. 2001. In this plot, we can already uh, see there are three methods that is uh, well performing. One of uh, two of them are our proposed methods, and the other one is the Gaussian mixture model. So we're going to go on to quantify uh, the the performance of each of the methods. So in in this table, we can see uh, the highest arc is achieved by the our proposed method, which is the Gaussian mixture version of autoencoder with TV restoration. And we can also see that it also achieved uh, the highest die score at 5% false positive rate. So now we can see that uh, we can find we, we find the uh, Gaussian mixture version of autoencoder with TV restoration as the best performing method. Uh, I'm going to move on to show you some uh, ex uh, visualized example of the detection of this method. So uh, the plot is generated at 5% uh, false positive rate, which is the which gives the best result of the dice scores. We can see on on the second row is the restored method. Uh, it's the restored uh, results. We can see the restoration is relatively naive, which is just uh, reduced the intensity of the uh, of the autonomy. But turn out it is enough to detect the, the, the lesion using this. We can see that the difference is calculated in, this, in the third row, and it's better visualized as the predicted segmentation as in the fourth row here. We can see uh, comparing to the ground truth, uh, the predicted segmentation roughly matches with the uh, ground truth segmentation. Even the model has never seen an image with lesion during training. Uh, we also have one example that is also plotted using this, the same examples, but at, uh, at the false positive rate of 1%, we can see that the segmentation here is a bit limited uh, and, and is slightly worse than the performance at 5% 5 per, 5 false, false positive rate. And, and here we have the results for 10% false positive rate, uh, where we can see the uh, where, where we can see actually give us more uh, false positives, because here we choose a higher positive rate. So to conclude that uh, our proposed methods uh, detect lesion more accurately and also achieve the state of the art performance by making a more principled use of the estimated PX. And the uh, possible future work could be, for example, to have a more accurate approximation of this PX instead of substituting it with the elbow estimated by versional autoencoder. And uh, other work might also be to restore the uh, underlying real anatomy instead of just reducing naively the intensity in the abnormal regions. So we thank uh, our sponsors, which, uh, which is a, a Swiss National Science Foundation. Also, we thank uh, NVIDIA for our, the GPU support. Thank you. Please visit our posters. Are there any questions?
Thank you very much. If it works, oh yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm here. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm here. <laughs> so the images that you showed, they were um, like uh, from the 3D data, they were in the middle of the 3D data, like when the brain uh, is complete. So uh, what is the performance on the whole 3D data, especially the first scans and when we don't have lesion? And uh, for the cases that the lesion is very small, does it miss them? Uh, do we have a lot of false predictions? So the question is, so if we perform this on the 3D data and when the lesion is very small, is it missed? Uh, yes, for example, yep. for the first slices, when we don't have the lesion, mm -hmm. uh, how is the prediction? And also, what is the prediction and the performance on uh, very small lesions? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, we don't explicitly show the, uh, the detection results on just healthy data, but uh, in, in, experimentally, we confirmed that the, on, on the healthy data, it will have some false positive rates. It will have some false positives because we choose the false positive rates on the healthy data. So it will definitely also give us some, uh, some detected lesions. Uh, for the reason that is, uh, we don't have the image with lesion during training, so that's uh, a compromise to, to generate the segmentations. And for the second question, yes, when the lesion is very small, actually it's already shown in this plot. So you can see at the uh, rightmost column, when the lesion is very, very small, it's, it's even very difficult for, for me to find it by eye. So for the, for the, uh, for the algorithm, it's also very challenging. So the, the, the detection performance is not very satisfying for when the lesion is extremely small. Any other question? I had one on my side. Um, how does your lambda, or how would you, would your lambda uh, training change according to the size of your lesions in your data set, and is it related to the size of your uh, lesions? I'm sorry, you reformulated? Uh, is uh, the lambda that you try to optimize to, for the consistency uh, term? Yes. Is it dependent on the size of the lesion in your training set? Um, I wouldn't say it would be dependent on the size of the lesion be because uh, when we choose the lambda, it's chosen uh, empirically on the healthy data set where we don't have any lesions. Um, but I think in the, in the visualization, it might show it, has, it, it uh, performs better when the lesion is more obvious or of a relatively larger size, but I wouldn't say that it's the, uh, the lambda will be, uh, will prefer a lesion of a certain size, but I would just say that the lesion of a larger size is generally easy for the algorithm to pick out. Perhaps related to that, I was wondering uh, what is the effect on the, of the total variation term on, on the kind of lesions you can really segment. I, I would imagine that uh, it prefers homogeneous intensity lesions and heterogeneous mm -hmm. might become problematic. Uh, what is your experience there? Uh, yes, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. So in, uh, in our visualization, actually, most of them are a relatively uh, homogeneous intensity. It's I think, so uh, at the moment we have the data sets from BRAS 2017 and we took the uh, data from the T2 domain where uh, most, of the, uh, most of the lesion have a relatively homogeneous intensity, but if there are other data sets that the lesion does not appear to either to be always uh, higher intensity than normal regions, I think I will 
be happy to test our algorithm on that, but now just limited by our data set, we don't really have data set that have very complicated texture of the lesions. So that's our thank our speaker again.